Yeah, hi, good afternoon, hello everyone. Um, a really, really warm welcome once again to the 73rd Berlinale and to this, today's Directors Exchange on Journeys of Rebellion and Truth, Trans Narratives as Tools of Unapologetic Self-Representation, hosted by Teddy and the Queer Academy. Um, my name is Jamila Granitz, I'm, I'm part of the pre-selection here at Panorama and I'll be navigating through the talk and I'm more than happy to introduce uh, this afternoon's guest. Uh, guests, <laughs> yeah, we have D Smith, <laughs> <Woo. laughs> director, editor, cinematographer, producer, a two-time Grammy-nominated um, musician, artist, um, who's found uh, her journey into filmmaking recently, and is her here with her premiere of Kokomo City, which has been prior premiered um, at Sundance earlier this year. So. It's such a pleasure having you, and Thank we're you. curious to hear more. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, my name is Dee Smith, um, director of Kokomo City. Um, I uh, basically the film is about um, experiencing the journeys of four uh, black transgender women that happens to do sex work t to survive, and. Um, but this film is, I think, a little bit more uh, uh, detailed and uh, more intimate. And that's helped a lot w with creating the film. Um, and these women were very candid and uh, open and uh, vulnerable. And all the things I like in a film, and they're very funny. And um, yeah, it was super raw, the way that I shot that I shot them, and um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, it was a great experience. The premiere is actually happening tomorrow night. We're yeah. all very much looking forward to that. Again. Yeah. I'm so excited. And there's then four more screenings after that, and um, yeah, we'll delve deeper into the context of the film in a second. Great. Yeah. So next to me, uh, we have Vuk Lungulov Klotz. <laughs> <laughs> living in New York City, um, a Chilean servant filmmaker raised between Chile, New York, and Serbia, and um, alum of the Sundance Institute, um, the Tribeca Lab, and um, the Ryan Murphy Hoff Initiative Program. And um, it is your debut feature fiction, but uh, you've been touring many, many festivals with your short that has been happening before, which is called Still Liam. And um, yeah, we're keen to hear about your journey into filmmaking too. Would you mind uh, sharing the context of your film, um, Mott, that is premiering tonight actually um, here at Berlinale? Yeah, I'm very excited. It's premiering tonight at eight. Um, yeah. Mutt um, is a portrait of a trans man. It takes place within 24 hours where you get to live in these very intimate relationships he is trying to pick up his estranged father from the airport tomorrow, and that's like our vehicle to meet his little sister, his ex-boyfriend that he um, interacts in a bar. So it's just a very, in, hopefully, insider point of view of what it can look like to be a son, um, a brother, a lover, while being trans as a mixed half-Latino um, New Yorker. So just very near and dear to my heart. I really love it, so yeah. Yeah, thank you for that summary. Um, before we go deeper into the context, because you already mentioned that relationship, kinship, family is really a strong issue in your film, and I think in similar ways, but yet different ways, um, it is also in Kokomo City, like this question of relating and belonging and home. Um, I'd maybe like to hear about your journeys into filmmaking, because Dee, you're actually coming from the music industry, and that really reflects in your work. So it's so musical, it's so sonic, like the editing, the rhythm is so there. And you also produced and created your own soundtrack that is uh, truly amazing. But what does it mean to you to also change media as a form of self-expression, and what was um, the initiative moment when you decided to go into filmmaking? Um, well, as a creator, from a child, I've always wanted to do everything. I just went with one of those children my family could not keep up <laughs> with. I could not stay out of 
trouble in school because I think now that I think about it, I was just bored. I think creatively, math, <laughs> social studies just wasn't my thing. And <laughs> I didn't want it to be a thing. I wanted to experiment with visuals and sound and color and, you know, and I was stifled and held back from doing that as a creator. And um, wow, which is the first time I ever acknowledged that. That is uh, very traumatizing for a child that, you know, that's who you are, your identity, you're a creative person. And uh, to be stuck in the classroom for eight hours doing something that genuinely doesn't resonate with you is just sad. So anyway, when I had the opportunity to, well, first of all, the opportunity to create film came because uh, after 15 years of producing uh, music, um, I decided to transition um, and, you know, people just went away. People stopped calling, people stopped supporting, sp stopped offering opportunities as a producer and I just went broke. I lost everything um, in a matter of years, a couple years. And um, a few more years went by of me just being homeless, sleeping on couch to couch to sofa to sofa and floors, you know, <laughs> Grammy uh, plaques and things like that, you know, with me, it, did, it didn't matter. I had the idea to do Kokomo City because I thought, wow, you know, I did everything right by the book. I've never been in any trouble. I've never been to jail, I, you know, and I'm still in this situation. I've, I've not, doing sex work was never an option for me because I was blessed with opportunity to create. But at that moment I, I thought, if I'm in this situation, I can't even imagine a trans woman who've never had any option. And, and I eventually really connected with a sex worker, even though I've not done sex work, I just thought, what other options do I have other than sex work? After everything I've accomplished. So I, I, I basically created this film by asking people to help me. And of course, people denied helping me. And uh, I ended up doing the film myself because everyone told me no. And so here I am. It's in really, Berlin. really great to have you, and it's wonderful you. that you are here. Thank you. In this very moment. Thank you. Very glad to be here. The, was it clear to you from the very beginning on that you would choose a documentary form? Because you say in this creation, in this narration, it was an urge to you to create the stories and give space to those stories, reflecting your own, but also taking it further. Um, yeah, was it clear to you that you would start documentary and really start those conversations with real people and depict them on screen? Absolutely. That was, I was so eager to do it. A documentary because, um, it, I mean, it would have been very easy for me to play into the whole trauma of being transgender, right? Even with my own experience, I could just tap into, oh, what was me? Oh my God, another statistic. Oh my God, you know, <laughs> another black trans woman in 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 New York. I, you know, it's just I wanted to do something that I actually would want to watch, you know, and it's not to trivialize any documentaries that have come before me, which are important as well. But in the middle of a pandemic, I think I wanted to do, genuinely do something that was different, rock star, uplifting, beautiful, and, and risky. And risky in the sense of doing something that people would probably raise a brow at, right? And so I've always wanted to do scripted and narrative but obviously I didn't have the time, the actors, the money or anything. So I pushed the documentary as far towards that as possible. And it created this dichotomy of, you know, what Kokomo City has become. So uh, yeah, everything happens for a reason. I was, I was forced to do this film because I, I don't think I would have ever done it, to be honest with you. Had one director said, yeah, I do it. But I also thought if a director did it, I would just be a total bitch. I would be micromanaging. No, 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 no. You know, so it worked out. <laughs> We're super glad you did it yourself. 
But as mentioned, what you also did yourself is a soundtrack. So what does it mean to you to translate your prior practice or your ongoing practice, but like to connect those two forms of expression and how do, how do you want to take it further? Yeah. I mean, for a moment, five seconds I'll give you to just put yourself in my position where you music is your life and it was taken away from you because of who you are, right? And then this idea and the opportunity and the ability to create something that could create a place for your music. My God, it's like, it's divine. And um, I, I literally, you can't ask for a better, <laughs> I can't, I, I'm sorry guys. I, I Just hearing myself even say this is just, I'm blown away how incredibly profound life could be when time is perfect for you. And um, I, I want to just embrace this and maximize this moment and do the best that I can as a creator with the time left that I have on this planet. And so the music is such a huge part of my life. And the fact that I could do whatever, how I see it, you know? Not everyone got my music, but this makes sense. My, my music in film feels right, you know? Yeah. It feels very right, and there's not only music as music there, but there's also, you said, you push the documentary to the fringes, there's performance elements, there's fiction elements, there's staged elements, and it made me think a lot of music video too, you know? It's like also aesthetics coming from the industry. Um, you said rock star and vulnerable, and it's exactly this thin line between, you know, creating this really precious, fragile space for your protagonists, and on the other hand, making them the roxes of your film while staging them. And I was wondering if you'd willing to be share, uh, uh, if you will to share um, about this very approach also to the music video and the stagings and did you come up with it all by yourself? Was it a co-creative process with your protagonists? How did that go? No, no all me, everything me, no. Um, it, <laughs> it was, uh, no, it was, if the, pro the creative process was, was my idea, but aesthetically I really wanted being transgender, male or female, is such a rock star thing. And people like to make it political and, and make it this thing. And it's really not that serious. It's just beautiful and it's rare and real. And if people would just, even trans people would just fucking back off and, and let true transgenderism thrive, people will actually get to see what beauty we have, but we're so defensive all day, every day. It's like, I want it not that. I want it, I want it not to glorify sex work, but I don't want to shame it either. This is just a reality that trans women have to go through for now. Maybe not forever, but for now, this is what's happening. It's been like that from the beginning of transgenderism. It's just been sexualized. And I think, okay, if we want to be treated as humans and looked at as humans, we can't be ashamed of our parts. We can't be ashamed of talking like everyone else get to talk. We can't be ashamed of kissing a guy in a film. And no one should feel weird about that. It is natural if you're attracted to someone. Whoever you're attracted to is a natural thing. It's just natural. And, and it's time for us to naturalize and normalize being transgender. And it's just because you see a trans woman kissing a guy, it doesn't mean that it's porn. It's just, it's romantic and it's beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing this. And then also, I mean, you, you really make a key to reflect upon those very, very thin lines with your protagonists, you know, this, the bias within community, the bias within oneself, the, the whole um, screen for projections, and as you say, sexualizations, exoticizations, um, 
then the whole question of also stigma and taboo coming in, whilst on the other hand, um, there is a fetish going on. Yeah. So this is really, really central too. It's highly political, and um, I guess it must have been challenging also to to navigate those conversations because they are very vulnerable because it's a thin line of belonging and hostility in the very same space. Is that something you could maybe elaborate on? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think the whole point of doing Kokomo City was just to kind of break through the gas, I meant the gas, the glass ceiling. <laughs> break through the gas, woo! Um, break through the glass ceiling. I think the conversation, um, particularly between trans people and black people, is just stopped. Everyone is just like, nope, I hate you, nope, it's wrong, nope, screw you, and that's where we are right now, and we're kind of living around that, as opposed to really coming together, right? So it is not easy to do anything first. It's not easy to go against the grain, it's not. But it's, it's so appealing to me. I'm addicted to that, you know, because there's room for it. There's so many things that we're just bullshitting around and it's just fake. It's like, you know, I think that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, <laughs> there's so much space to fill in outside of, uh, you know, these talking points that we've kind of been taught mm -hmm. to have. You know, so it's a, it's a new time, new day for a new conversation. Thank you so much, Dee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the addiction also of going against the grain at the same time, oftentimes being an urgency or a necessity was maybe also one of the starting points of our conversation outside. Is, is there even a choice? to being unapologetic or not. Look, you chose a narrative feature for your debut, um, and you do something really interesting with time there, because you actually expand time, like cinematic time, on-screen time. There's 24 hours that we delve through within rough 90 minutes. So it's this one-day experience from, like, we're cruising through night and day, and then there's all those webs of social relations that, um, that we cross through, but it's also the city of New York that we cross through. And both of your films actually play in New York part day of this. Um, so I was wondering, narration and cinematic narration, how did you find your way into it, and how was it important for you to, to find narrative structures and also to create forms of storytelling for your main character, for your protagonist, and for your pr protagonist's biography that is really condensed into this, you know, glimpse in their time and life. I think I understood the question. It's about <laughs> how did I find my way? Why did I choose that kind of? Um, yeah, I like I said before, I wanted to create a portrait. I wanted to. I wanted someone who maybe doesn't know a trans person to walk away from this movie and going like, wow, I know Fenya now. Mm. The next time I hear the word trans, that's who comes to my mind. Like now I have a friend who is imperfect, who is selfish, and is so human that you understand like, oh, they actually remind me of this person. We're, we're not so different. Um, so for me, 24 hours was just a very natural, rich narrative structure um, to drop us in Maybe a little forced with how much happens, but I think that just happens. Every day is really hard. I was pitching at Tribeca <laughs> for this um, movie, and one of the questions was, is your character, your, is your lead gonna need therapy after doing this movie? And I was just like, no, being trans is hard every day. Not beca because you're seeing it on screen doesn't mean that it's not happening every day. Um, so I think that was also just great to have like the amount of times that the character explains himself might seem unnecessary for a cis person that doesn't have to explain themselves that many times a day, but it really is just a hard, yeah, it's a hard way of living. Um, did that answer the question? Yes, you did. Um, I think I want to go deeper into it though, because I really like this drifting through time and also relations, because, and one, 
hand, you really like give us a deep insight into this small window of time, but it refers so much back to pasts and futures. So it's an in-between state that is opening up also in like in this beginning in the night. It's like in between waiting for someone to arrive, then someone comes back who's unexpected without giving away too much. Um, I was wondering how this in-between state, but then also this idea of like traces of the past always coming back, this idea of being hunted, but not only hunted, but always connected to what has been, was important to you. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I love the word in between. I think as a trans person, I love to embody it. I think the strength that we have as trans people is that in between, is that understanding of everything. And to have such a small window of time, you can really talk about some of the barriers that we put up and the different people that we come with, diff the way people make us react and um, what is it to be an older brother as opposed to what is it to just be out and about with your friends. So I think you mentioned it, but when you were talking before, but you just put up a lot of barriers. You're very, um, you're very defensive, right? So I think you can kind of break down that defensiveness when you spend a whole day with someone mm. and you see how they change. And the in-between is not only in-between times, like pasts and futures, but it's also um, in-between people. But it's also um, the depiction of a Latinx person navigating New York. Um, and um, there's this in-between call just because through the father figure, there's also this, this question of, um, yeah, of belonging and maybe transnational belonging um, coming in. How was that important to you um, to reflect? Yeah. yeah, I think I was very hungry to see someone like myself. Obviously, I'm not, I'm very white and my character is brown. We're kind of like the mirror opposites of who we are. Like, I grew up in Chile, came to the States when I was 18. They kind of did this opposite. Um, but I just wanted to talk about intersectionality and just needed to see that on screen. And the reactions that I've been getting from people are really beautiful. Like, they're, everybody's hungry for this story, for these moments that they get to see for the first time. Um, so just, I grew up with a mom in Chile, a dad in Serbia, and me kind of everywhere. So for me, it was also important to talk about more like international, global ways of having a family, how you only have a week to talk to someone you love. You might not see them for four more years, and you really have to make the best out of it. I think that um, was really important with the little sister, with the dad. You never know how much time you have, especially when you're trans. Like, I wasn't allowed to see my brother. I wasn't allowed to come out to him for like eight years. So I just didn't go back to Serbia for a while. So you never know. Yeah, yeah thank you so much for this. I think the hunger you're referring to is very, very real. And it's a beautiful contribution to that. Um, I'd very much like to hear from you because we're talking about working with protagonists because I think it's really also um, key. We were talking about the spaces we create for our characters or for characters on screen, but also um, I was thinking about casting. So maybe you want to go a little bit into how you met Leo um, because they have a beautiful performance um, on screen and um, they just play it beautifully. And how did you meet each other? How did you find each other for this collaboration? Yeah. Thank you, I'm very proud of Leo. Um, it took two years to find my actors. Uh, it was very hard to find a mixed trans masculine person. Um, so I, I got very frustrated. I went out to like kind of bigger people. They said yes and said no, wasted eight, eight months of my time. So then I just took it upon myself to ask my community. I called as many colleges as I could think of, as many acting classes, lots of Instagram. And I compiled a list of about 120 names, which is actually kind of a beautiful map of the states, because a lot of those people were like not actors that were just excited that this was happening. And they were brave enough to like come out, feel safe, and say, I might be terrible, but would, I would love to audition. So that was really a very sweet and stressful <laughs> experience. <laughs> and then I found Leo and I just, I remember it very clearly. I saw their tape and just like sat up on my bed and was like, amazing, I can make my movie. Because at one point I wasn't finding anybody that was um, part Latin American and I wasn't going to, I didn't want to whitewash a character from Chile so I was kind of rethinking the story and 
maybe he can be half Serbian, and we just talk about that. But I'm really happy that I got to find um, Leo, because I just think that, that that's the story I wanted to tell. And he existed, and now <laughs> we love each other. Um, yeah, and we like went camping for a few days together before shooting to like try to <laughs> to really get each other. But yeah, this without finding him, he helped shape this character um, and the movie as a whole. It was very much like a specific script that I had written, but I knew that until I could find that person, it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna be whole. It was gonna be very much a collaborative mm. building experience of who Fenya, the lead, is. Yeah, that was the next question I was about to ask you. Like, did did you work very closely to the script, or the moment Leo came in to open up a space for um, them to fill the character? Word-wise, yes. Mean, you definitely did, but I mean, word-wise, lines-wise, yeah. Lines, nothing changed. It was all the same. It was more of um, who they were. I think I wrote a much more villainous character. I really wanted to have, and Leo's so sweet, I wanted to have like an anti-hero, hateable character. And, and I think there's still moments when the character is so selfish. Because mm. I think, for me as a trans person, I find myself most humanized on film or in my life when I'm hold, held accountable for my past when I'm not like forgiven or, which is an interesting thing to talk about. But yeah, so the script was exactly the same, but just a different version, just the version that could exist, you know, a, a sweeter, more gentle version of the character, you know. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, is there questions you have for each other? Because we've heard so much already and we're deep down in the conversation. Um, is, there, is there a topic that you want to jump in? Um, in on from what what's been said <laughs> now. I have like I have a bunch of questions. It's not like that I'm gonna pass it on, but um, yeah. Well, I mean, we've talked so candidly before this. Now you're putting us on the spot. We're all yeah. shy. <laughs> yeah. Now it's we're like in formulaic. the corner. Just had so much to say, and I'm like, oh. I don't have anything to say. No, but I'm um, I'm so proud of him. Like I I am I'm so proud of you and yes. and. Even amongst ourselves, there's so much that we that we know as trans people that we want to bring to the table, and and I I I, I think that we're as creatives really just want not to be put in that same expectational box. And uh, I mean, I don't I don't want I don't want that. I mean, like I want to create, and. Um, but there's so much as a community that we have to really address ourselves to move forward. And uh, <sighs> there's a lot of responsibility for how we represent and how, by creating an image or a voice, we somehow are trying to talk about every single trans person. We were kind of talking about that, which is a hard responsibility and it sucks. Yeah, um, yeah. especially when it's like first. Yeah. So. So I'm, I'm not trying to talk about how every single trans man is. Right. I'm, I'm trying to tell you about this one right. guy named Fenya Absolutely. who has to go pick up his dad. That's right. But And that's how I feel with yeah. Kokomo City. These girls don't represent all trans women. All trans women don't do sex work. Like people a lot of a lot of people really associate trans women with sex work. It's just been a historical thing from Jerry Springer to Maury Povic to all the all the the you know things in the '90s and '80s that kind of like created helped create that as well. But this is also very new as trans people, right? Like trans women don't have to come out creeping out of the shadows at night anymore. This is new. This is very new for everyone. How do we accept trans women looking like us? How do we expect? How do we accept them not wearing makeup like drag queens all day? How do we accept them being attracted and having access to the same men? It's not the clownery '90s, '80s, '70s thing anymore. This is like a real thing, and I think we're as trans women are also having to adjust with the reality that yeah, we're starting to blend in socially, but you know there are things that kind of keep us separated and and segregated, and um, it's new for everyone. But I, my my approach is like we have to talk about some real shit and just get out. We have to do it, and <laughs> the things that I see for trans women and people may not happen in my lifetime, but this 
this is about us creating a better way for the future, right? Not just for trans people, but for society. So there's a lot, there's a lot on, the, on the table for us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are definitely, the history has been happening for eternity, especially black trans women. I mean, we owe so much of our culture to them. But yeah, we're the first, some of the first generation to, we don't have role models. We're our role models. I was, I was saying this to someone maybe earlier. Um, when I came out, I was the first trans person that I had ever met. That was me, and I think, I don't know if that was your experience. <laughs> it's dope, but it sucks. <laughs> it sucks to not be able to talk to anybody, but it was dope in the sense that I was 20, I was still in college, and within the next two months, I had four people come out to me in secret who were like, I don't know if I'm gonna come out to anybody else, you know, keep it secret. And I was like, of course, of course, but there was this like wave that just started happening. I'm not saying I was a, I'm not, it's not just me, but in my space, it was cool no, to see No, no, you were. Yeah. No, 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 you were. In that space. No, you were. <laughs> and, and you impacted people enough to help create a better trajectory for us as a community. Like, you totally, that was huge. Within a small community, yeah. It's okay. But it's weird to be a, like a mentor at the same age as someone else. And I think that's something that we do a lot, right? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's all about that that moment. It's, it's like, this is a horrible analogy, I think, but like in, in Africa, there's like a point in every year where all the wildebeest, they know they have to cross this gator infested river, but somebody's got to do it. And they're all looking like, blah, 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 blah. And they're all looking around like, I'm not going in there with their little legs and big bodies. And one of them have to go in there. And that's the trans one you're saying. That's the trans one. <laughs> right, right. I get this. This is very good. <laughs> OK. Right. Like I said, horrible analogy. <laughs> oh, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, <laughs> that was the trans one. So, so we're, <laughs> yeah. we're on the but, front line. But yeah. You were saying, we, we, we first asked when we were about to talk, um, what was the word you used? What's in the title of this? The, the question of being unapologetic. Yeah, and I had said that we can't afford not to be, and it is not, like, we have to be that gator. To use your analogy, to keep using it, we have to be that. Yeah. It's, not, yeah. it's an option. But, but for it's me, it's life or death. Whole, it's, to help, it's to help all of those that are behind you, whether they're scared or not. But once they see you go in, they're going to chuck behind you. And that's kind of what's happening with Kokomo City. Like, the more men... That's awesome. The more men, black men, are, are hitting my DMs and hitting some of the guys that were, I have a really big mouth, didn't even need the mic. You know, and, and, and um, you know, a lot of, uh, a couple of the guys in the film are getting DMs like, yeah. bro, mm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Like, however they process and whatever they're going through, it's impacting, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's what it's all, all about. I mean, they even say it in the documentary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and we're talk we're talking about journeys, and and you start you said you started off with like basically zero support, and the way you made this film um, is also like emerged from the urgency of having zero support, and we're really glad you did so. But the fact that so many people came on board only now within the last few weeks and months, and the response you're getting is so telling. Can you maybe like? Delve a little bit into into this fact and how how to process that and how to you know f how how do you deal with that now? I mean, it's amazing to have such a resonance, I imagine, but it must be uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to clarify, lack of support. I edited this entire film on iMovie. That's yeah. That's how much support I had. I had no choice, no support, no money. Goddamn. You know, and um, it, it, it got, remembering that moment, and I was perfectly fine with that. I was okay. I was creating, I was in the vibe, and I had no worries. Um, poor, my poor producer had to deal with that, taking it off a of iMovie and trying to find a way <laughs> to get it. I'm sorry, Harris. <laughs> um, but to think of that time when I was on the couch, editing and, and looking at my first footage and, you know, until now it is, come on, like, I don't have to explain this. Like, you can only imagine. And I, I, and 
And I always tell people the worst part about all of this experience is that there are literally no words that have been invented yet for me to explain the gratitude and, and that could encompass this experience. And I've always, when I watch television, when people are winning awards or on the red carpet, I always say, I don't want to be that person. Oh, I'm just so grateful and thank you. And that's exactly what you got to do. <laughs> because <laughs> what else could you possibly say? Uh, but, but this is so gratifying and so inspiring and encouraging that, that people are relating themselves or connecting themselves somehow to my work. And they see themselves, no matter how they identify, they see themselves in this film somehow. A, a pregnant black woman that's four months pregnant said, you inspired me to love my unborn child differently. My God. But there's this narrative that trans women and black women are fighting and we hate each other. It's like, no, it's not real. It's not real. And to have that, to be the first person when I walk off that stage after my premiere to say that, the best moment of Sundance for me. The greatest, the, the greatest moment. So, yeah. That's, that's great. It is, it really, really is. Book when, yeah, well, because we talk about the industry and we talk about like also reflections from and feedbacks. And um, I mean, you, you said you were pitching your film in Tribeca and um, the, there was a whole production journey ahead and um, before and you have a lot of now also distribution ahead. Um, how did you experience that? Because uh, you, you just mentioned this uh, weird notion of responsibility when it comes to representation that we have uh, in queer contexts that we have in relation to race and to transcultural narratives. Uh, and it's this really a heavy load that no one can actually keep up to and no one should be um, uh, carrying because it's basically impossible. But dealing with that whilst trying to finance and produce a narrative and a story is, I imagine, oftentimes navigating this very thin line where people actually want to box you. And due to boxing you, they start funding and supporting you. Um, if we look at the industry and maybe also talk about ideas, visions, and, and um, yeah, necessities of change, um, would you be willing to tell us about your experience when it comes to those you know, pitches, pre-production states, and um, yeah, framings? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can try. Um, it's, you, you're asking kind of a big question, but I think I wrote this close to I wrote this script close to six years ago, um, and it, a lot has changed in in that time. And it's been like five years of actually trying to get that the movie made. So I think, if I understand your question correctly, I've in, in real time have seen people be more willing to talk about things and to give us money and to be excited to see a trans man on screen. Um, even within my own friends, I would say, my, 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 the people that are my age, you know, very like cool <laughs> Brooklyn people that still are, are figuring it out. But um, I don't know if I can say much more about that. I want to <laughs> keep telling you, but it was just hard. I mean, it was hard to get trust. Um, I'm very grateful to the Sundance Labs for picking up the script. I went five years ago, and if I did not have that chip on my shoulder, I don't know if people would have been willing to listen. So I think that they were very smart to give me um, a little torch to go carrying around, because I wanted to give up. I wanted to, it was just a lot. I wanted to still be in love with my movie, and so much time had gone by that I didn't. I wanted to give it the justice and, and love that it needed to be the best version of itself. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm responding to the question. I did get so frustrated about like a year, last, like a year and a half ago is when I said now or never, um, and I just put all my force into it, and the movie got made with the incredible team that I have. But yeah. You, you did definitely answer a big part of the question. I think I've already packed the next one directed to the two of you into it. And it's really also the necessities of what has to change in the industry to maybe lessen this 
um, idea of a burden, you know, this like single single narrative representation um, issue that is also a construction of okay, this is the corner for the queer films, and this is the corner for the black films, and this is the you know. Um, mm. So if we if we think about visions and and envisions and, and also joint struggles, um, and you were mentioning also this inter intersectional approach in narration. Or what would you envision or, or wish for, or what are we actually striving and, and fighting for at this very moment? I think that was a question that was coming from the experience that you just shared, that is obviously a hard and also a painful one oftentimes. So. It is. I mean, what has to happen to change? We have to happen. We're doing it, I think. <laughs> um, the fact that we're both here, went to Sundance, that's incredible. <laughs> that's, I'm so proud. So. More people have to be brave and, I don't know, not give up. I mean, even me, I'm writing, um, I'm working on my two next scripts and I had to, I had a moment of, I can't believe I'm writing another movie with a trans man as a lead. I'm gonna go have to find that actor again. Mm -hmm. And I had a moment of doubt where I was like, do I wanna do that? And I was like, wow, if I, as a trans man, am afraid to make another trans movie, holy shit. Mm -hmm. So I was like, shut up, keep going, you will find them. You found Leo, now Leo is in the world, so like, let's, yeah. yeah. It's so important what you're doing. I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, do you wanna elaborate on the, on the industry question? You know, yeah. Well, I mean, I just wanna say that my, my intention is to do everything that everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. That is just simple as that, and, and, and then some. You know, and uh, hmm, I, I want to say something, but then I don't. But, but I, I will say that, um, listen, I grew up watching heterosexual people make love, have sex, and uh, it didn't change who I am. And people think because trans people are being marketed and we're being accessible to children that is just gonna change children. These are the type of <laughs> these are the type of things that we're we're up against as well. You know, um, no one's going to be converted into something that they're not. That's just unnatural. It's just very not a realistic thing to do. Like I I am not a heterosexual person in the traditional sense and uh, neither do I want to be. Um, I love being transgender, and my whole thing is to, to tap into that place that transgender people can be proud to just be transgender, not compete, not to feel less than, not to feel like there has to be some type of over, you know, uh, uh, action to be equal, because that's what we're, we're doing. We have to overcompensate for so much, and uh, I think just putting us in the same space that everyone else is enjoying, you want to be nude? Well, guess what, honey? We're going to be nude, too. <laughs> That's as simple as that. You cannot get mad at that. But, but the more uh, film and context that we have, not just sex, just normal day things, that, uh, that, that I think that will help where I would like to see the community go. Thank you so much. We do actually have an audience mic, um, so if you have questions, thoughts, things you want to share, please join the conversation. Is there anyone who has something on their minds they'd like to throw in? Don't be shy. Are they scared? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I haven't seen your movie yet, but I'm looking forward. Really? It's on my notebook. Um, thank you for sharing all this. Uh, you're brave, obviously. And my, my question is, in terms of production, uh, you, um, how did you film? Because you had nobody to, you had no um, means to edit, you said, but uh, how did you have money for cameras and, uh, and so on? Yeah. So uh, I was completely broke, no money. I was sleeping on the floor at, uh, at this guy's house that my friend had said, it's okay for me to stay at his house 
<laughs> I was sleeping on someone's floor, and after living with him for about three or four months, I felt comfortable enough to ask him if he would buy the camera. He had seen some of my footage that I had shot around the city, and I was shooting it in black and white on my, on my iPhone. He was like, bitch, this, bitch, this is good, girl. Girl, this is good, bitch. I was like, great. I want to shoot a documentary. And I said, this is how I wanted to feel. This is how I wanted. He was like, well, go get the camera. Let me know what it's going to be. And we went in a matter of days and got the camera and the lens. And um, then I hit another friend up for a, 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 a laptop to support the, the actual footage. And um, yeah, I just, I just started filming. I made, yeah, I had to learn a lot. But I, I think my, my favorite part of the whole process of making Kokomo City was editing. It, it was just so fulfilling and satisfying. It was just so fun, fun to do. And the fun and the joy is really perceivable. It's so there. Thank you. Yeah. You have something if to look I forward may. to. Sure. If I may. Um, how is your musical career? Ooh. Ooh. Uh, no. Okay. So I'm working on a, an original soundtrack for the movie. And I will say this. The, the music is the best music I've ever done in my life. I have labels asking to sign the project. And uh, I, I'm not going to do too much, but I will say the last artist I was in the studio with was CeeLo Green. And that was incredible. And so, uh, so that will be one person that is featured. And uh, there's others that I'm not going to say right now, but it's really good. Feels great. Thank you. So looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. Is there another question, thought, comment? Don't be shy. <laughs> sure, I am shy, but hello. Feel um, free to be shy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you for making the probably two of my favorite films this year. Um, cried, laughed. Uh, so thanks, thanks. It was an amazing experience, both of the films. Um, and I'm excited to see them again. <laughs> Uh, but my question, maybe you've answered this already, but I think um, as a trans person and also looking at all, there, there has been a bit of a boom in like trans films, but I feel like ish, yeah. In terms of like uh, from before, <laughs> like where there was nothing uh, to uh, I guess two, <laughs> let's say. Um, that's a boom for us. Um, but in terms of also like, both of your film has have been different in terms of like you actually feel the playfulness, the the daring to do something different instead of sticking to uh, some trans narrative, usually not directed by trans people, which says something. Um, how like they kind of stay to a script and like these trans characters are always the same, and the story is always the same, and it's sad or like you know or it's like trying to put somebody as a hero, but like you uh, in Kokomo City, just like breaking through the norms and like turning a documentary into like just uh, the funnest experience I've had uh, while still talking about all these uh, really important topics and then with Matt just like making this character be human and like, uh, you know, like fucked up and also like go through life as anyone else. Like how, I talk too much, but like how, how has that been the process of making this film and just being yourself and following your God and like showing like that trans storytelling can also like, doesn't have to stick to anything. It can be anything you can create and especially as trans folks. Long, sorry. Um, we were talking about trans joy a little bit earlier, and that as watching your movie, I felt joy, I felt love. I mean, we're talking about some hard stuff, but we, if you can't make fun of something or make a joke or, or see the levity of it, like, I don't want to watch that movie. So I think 
we're not taboos, we're not martyrs, we're not great. A lot of my trans friends are pretty shitty people, but I love them. And a lot of my cis friends are shitty people and I love them. So I am tired of those cliches. I think is when we can see the humanity behind a story, that, that, that's, the more specific a story is, the more universal it is. And I think the more specific our trans characters get, the more universal people are, they are, right? And, and more accessible. So I was just excited to create something that I could see myself and my friends and in, in it, you know, yeah. I think my, my job was probably a lot easier than his in, in terms of <clears throat> mine's a documentary. So I just gave instructions or directions to the girls to say what I don't want and really what I do want. And I just want you to be yourself. Oh my God, girl, I gotta get glam and my nope. There's no wig. No wig, there's no heels, there's no makeup. I want you completely to be authentically yourself. And if I at any point filming you feel that you're going outside of yourself, we're just gonna cut. And I've only had to do that maybe once or twice because they were nervous or something like that. And uh, so I, I just I just filmed girls. Trans women just in their true self. That's it. And, uh, and uh, it, it didn't need much more than that. But I felt so safe. I felt that they were safe when, when I was hearing your int the, the interviews and, and watching the documentary. I think creating that safe space um, for us is, is new because we haven't been in positions of power. So that's something that I could feel on set mm -hmm. with a trans lead, with me. I had a lot of trans um, crew members, lots of queer people, and I think that joy that we talk about was very much like behind your lens and, and, and my lens, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like I said earlier, um, organizations and, and uh, agents or PRs, they, they, uh, they like to do this thing where they package trans women so perfectly and just put them on the red carpet with these bullet point lines to say and it's just, oh man, it's just so, I'm so tired of it. You know, it's like, at the end of the day, we just wanna feel human and be human. And the only way we could do that is to be relatable to other humans. How can we do that when every time they see us, we're a freaking beauty queen or we're, in a, we're a pageant and we're just, and I'm, I'm not saying that when you get on the red carpet, don't be articulate, don't be proud of that moment, but don't represent what's happening. And uh, all trans women, we laugh at ourselves. We key, we laugh at fucked up things that are happening to us or we laugh at bad dates or, or things that could have killed us. We laugh. No, they're not funny, but why are we laughing and no one else could laugh? So, you know, I, I, that was my approach to the film, and I want more of that from other directors, whether they're trans or not. I just think the whole thing about adding statistics to every film that we do is just like, <laughs> we know. And it's not to decred or to, to trivialize the women that are being murdered. But I think people are just losing interest in the trauma of, of being transgender. And I think there are so many other places to tap into to get people more motivated into supporting and acknowledging us as humans. That's all. So you had a really good question, Ashley. He did, right? <laughs> thank you for that question <laughs> and thank you for this really really clear statement that's so important we do have time for another one though is it yes please I think the, the, the conversation is being recorded so um, yeah good point thanks um, because you talked about um, trans joy for a minute, and I know this is celebrating you at the moment, but is there any other filmmakers that come to mind that is working today that you are excited about? I know that you might be blanking, so uh, I, I'll say one, Jane Sean Brown. Uh, we're all going to the World Fair, might be one, but uh, if you have others, uh, did you want to share with us? Uh, uh, directors that 
directors, but also outside the box, if you have, of course. Okay. I think it's your turn. I, 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 I just answered. Well, I was I don't want to come across self-centered. I do have people I look up to, so give me a second to think about it. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just talking about the things that are coming to mind right away. Just like I think a filmmaker like Xavier Dolan um, is someone that was very inspiring to me when I was growing up, and it was the first time that I saw queer intimacy through the queer lens and felt safe there, same as Andrew Hay um, in Weekend from 2011. But I'm definitely blanking. But the, like movies like that were inspiring back then. And then right now, I don't know, I'm so deep in the Brooklyn community. Who you mentioned, Jane, is a friend of mine. And her producer is a friend of mine. So I'm like very actively seeing all these incredible people come up um, and know of the movies that are you know being edited right now. And there is a lot of great stuff for sure, <laughs> but sorry I can't say any more names. I am liking. I, I, I mean, my answer is gonna be pretty shitty, but um, this world is new for me. And, and I absolutely am open to collaborating, discovering, meeting, being inspired by, um, you know, once I could kind of grasp Everything it is a lot happening right now for me to take on, and um, but I but I want to step back and see what's happening out there. You know who else is trying to do something remarkable, or you know impactful, or useful, you know creative, and uh, I want to be around that. So I think I'm going to need a little bit more time with that question, which which is actually also in of itself maybe goes to show how much we really need more. Yeah, I was gonna say what my EP, Silas Howard, I mean, trans daddy of filmmaking, you could say, God, I, I, I would tell that, I would say that to his face, so it's okay. Um, but they, he premiered his first a movie by Hooker by Crook at Sundance about 20 years ago and that's still someone like watching him be so powerful in TV. That's very inspiring. I was just hanging out with him, showing him the cut, and he like sits back and says something so bypassing. But he says like, "Oh, it's great that we were in a trend," because mm -hmm. he has been here for twenty plus years as a trans man mm -hmm. making movies and TV. And he just said that, and I was like, "Wow, you don't understand. Like that's incredible to have you." be here to tell me that like we are not a trend it's it's like we get to have dreams and then also ira Sachs, also an incredible mentor of mine but i think those two people are people that i personally admire and am grateful that they've carved a path that i could follow yeah. thank you so much is there one last question from the audience comment reflection yes Hi, we've been programming a queer festival for almost 15 years now, and one of the things that has happened over the years, and, I, and I'm wondering if in the moment, I experience how the narrative is changing because of directors like the two of you and, and, and people who are also working in this space in trans voices. Do you feel you're changing the narrative in the moment, or does it come after? Or Because I'm ex we're experiencing that this change in the narrative and the story that's being told. I'm just curious if you kind of know that in the moment. <laughs> we know we're cool, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it happens sometimes. Like, we won, um, my actor won Best Actor at the Sundance. No other trans person has won that. So yes, in that moment, I was like, holy shit, here we are making history again. There's so many firsts that still have to happen, and we are part of that. So I, I yeah, I, I, I feel it. <laughs> Great answer. I have, honestly, I have um, <clears throat> swells of, oh my God, and then I go, oh my God, I'm so tired. <laughs> so, I, again, I have not had that moment to really just step, I truly have not, and I, I'm not complaining, because I, I love what's happening for me personally and what's to come, but I honestly just have not had a break. I've not, I've just not. I live on South Beach, and I've not even gone to the beach for 10 minutes to just, it's always something. But I will say, 
I've gotten, I've gotten some amazing, I've had, people have said some amazing things about me and the film. Um, even at some of the heads at Sundance said stuff, and I, I like on the plane here, it was like an eight hour flight. I probably looked at one of the speeches, one of the things that someone said about me maybe 10 times. I was just like, damn, what? I was rewinding, I was like, what? And so I do, I do like you, but it's, it comes and swells in and out. So, but I, I know something happened in Sundance. Something yeah. went on, for sure. <laughs> I, I'd love to add, I've made this movie for everyone, which is a weird thing that trans people have to say. I fucking hate that sentence. I made this movie for an audience. I want people to see it, but somehow I have to be explicit about the fact that I, hopefully more than trans people will see themselves reflected in it. But it also hits me a lot when uh, queer people come to me crying after <laughs> screenings, talking about how they've never seen themselves, how they feel healed. And there it also hits me, because I'm like, I made it for you. This is great. I also, a lot of parents, lots of people telling me they want to see this with their family. So I think there, yes, because I don't hear that often about queer movies. Like, I can't wait to show this to my mom. <laughs> it's a sentence I've heard a lot, which is insane. Not what I thought would happen, but very happy. Um, to get those experiences. Wow, yeah, something is definitely happening and you are doing it, so <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, enjoy the rest of the day, the rest of the festival. Um, we have the two premieres to tonight and tomorrow, um, so go see the film, spread the word. Have a wonderful premiere here. Yeah. It's really our pleasure having you. you. And thank you. yeah, thanks. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Honestly. Thank you.